Today's draw along section will be Teotihuacan, the Pyramid of the Sun in uh, Mesoamerica in the pre Columbian days of this part of the world, the Western Hemisphere. It's an odd site because we really don't know too much about the people of Teotihuacan, the civilization, because it was sort of lost to us for some um, speculative reason, a whole series, whether it was weather-based or some type of disastrous flu or something just simply wasn't recorded in history. So it's all basically speculation, but aspects of their culture of the Tiwakanos was picked up by Aztec culture. And so some of the legacy gets carried on by other religions later on. So for us today, this is our last world religion, which kind of speaks for many other religions that don't have quite the same plurality or numbers behind them to hit the list of the first nine we drew. So this one is a bit more of a multi-ethnic because it, it's been used over periods of time by other people and speaks to a different type of religion, which is based on the stars, the sun, the principal Tiwakan deity was a female, the great goddess, who's often seen on murals with a mythical tree over her head. She's also known as a spider goddess sometimes because of the numerous birds and spiders that fly above the tree. So Teotihuacan, again, is in pre-Columbian Americas. It's located just about 25 miles outside of Mexico City in the sub-valley of the Valley of Mexico. So related to it, of course, because it is pyramidal, you just see in the image over here, it's a massive construction of human might. You can see uh, a relative model now from the view we'll draw it. We'll be looking at it from this left side as it sits on the Avenue of the Dead. And it'll be a simpler perspective because it's not very ornamental because a lot of the detail would have been lost over time. And its mass is really about the celebration of the deity on the top of it. So there's not any type of internal aspect to it. But it does have the presence of the pyramid that's shaped from other societies as well. Well before that, thousands of years before that, is the Grand Pyramid of Egypt, which still today is the largest pyramid ever built. And what these three, I'll show you also now a Mayan one, also in Mesoamerica area from later on after the Teotihuacans. But what they all share is that principal form of a pyramid so it's triangulated in the third dimension there. So it's got the greatest ability to be stable over time. And so you have something like this, which got started probably the century before the birth of Christ. And then um, this is obviously thousands of years old. And this is also gained up to being 1500 to 2000 years old, this coming series of centuries. And they really maintain their form very well because they're in the optimum position of having that weight distributed down along the angle of a 45 to prevent any type of erosion. So if you take away the two, they're sort of in the same language and get back to Teotihuacan. Somewhere settled around 200 to 300 BC, it reached the zenith about 800 years later in 400 AD. That's sort of the high point. Most of the stylistic things you find historically in architecture have got the early phase, its growth and development to its high phase where it peaks, and then sort of the downturn of it, which by 650 to 750 um, kind of marks the end of Teotihuacan as a major power in the Mesoamerica. So let's look at this in perspective now, and we'll see that we're going to be drawing this from a viewpoint across the Avenue of the Dead, but raised up on a plinth. So we're sort of not on the actual ground plane. We're kind of midsection, maybe the lower third section here of where our horizon line will be. So from your tick marks here, we'll see that that point of reference is almost splits the page in two. So we're raised up. So we're looking down a bit as well as looking up to the massive pyramid. Now, because it's it's such an, an enormous complex, it's a city that grew to have, they speculate, maybe a quarter million people, which would have made it oh, probably the sixth largest city on the planet at the time, if in fact there were that many people. As it grew to that, it had this enormous cultural impact on this part of the world. 
So because it's so broad and we're stepping away to get encapsulate as much as we can in a view shed of what the camera picks up, and then we'll sketch the same area. Um, then it takes the vanishing points and pushes them far off so that the right vanishing point, if we look from this top edge of the pyramid, the first tier, and then turn it at its corner and drift it back to the left edge, they both run off almost equidistant off the page about an inch or two. So remember, any horizontal line is going to have to go back to those points following off your page a bit. So what we'll do is we'll sort of locate that pyramid first. Move that back a bit. Continuing with the three main terraces here, one, two, and then the top. It kind of crowns that form. And then to allow it to be um, resistant to the pressures of all that stone growing vertically off the face of the earth, again, the sides are angled back down in that pyramidal shape. So each one will have a minor step to it as it makes its way down, down, and then finally meets the same plane that the walkway's on. And that is, from our point of view, sort of a touch tone for where the drawing's gonna be configured. Do the same for the other side. We're seeing a bit more of the left side of the pyramid. So these are a little bit shorter as they come down. But these are all parallel in space, and we don't really have to vanish them up to a point. You can see they all would eventually come to something right about up here as those diagonals, all being parallel, vanish at the same point if they had that. Um, we went ahead and did that to the vanishing point. And then we have at the base here the line of the closest edge to us of the Avenue of the Dead. And the far side of it vanishes back. And it does return to the other vanishing point, which we could use on secondary roads and movements, but it is such an enormous complex that, that doesn't happen within the view shed we're drawing from now. It's all a lineal path. It really moves its way off to the horizon line here. And at that point, we start to see our view. Since we're up, we're going to see some of the land tack back to this height in the distance. So this is probably a mile or two away. And this is probably a mile or two away where we see vegetation on the plain. And then as a form of reference, there is an actual natural hill, a mountain in the distance that probably is larger than the pyramid itself, but in this kind of view shed here, it almost seems like it's a man-made mountain foreground and a natural mountain in the distance. And then this movement of Earth vertically then passes through and goes off in the distance, and we see it picked up again with the mountain range coming off of our final height here of our first step. So this is just as high in the distance, but it's going back in perspective. So we see less of it as it trails away. So we need to get the notion of how far we can push this back with detail uh, to get the, the presence of this being the middle ground or foreground these some of the uh, ruinous type of smaller walls on top of the built architecture, the twin to this on this side, which will be our foreground. So uh, speaking of that, we'll just start with some of the uh, decayed walls, which are broken out and then have openings down. So we won't see them because they're mirroring the stairs that will be on this side. We'll draw in a little bit. So when you come to the openings here, there are stairs down to the lower level of the Avenue of the Dead. And then we'll see the shade side of the depth of that stone wall. And that returns over here and gets picked up again at this point, and that returns over here. All those lines kind of loosely vanishing to that left, right vanishing point. And then it comes to a bit of a corner, and now off of our left vanishing point, this one returns and shows that this was a type of space or outdoor room, at least in a ruin now, 
and it closes that bit. And then it continues again to yet, yeah, there's the top of that wall, another outbreak of vertical stone with the plinth on that. So we've got a little bit of language of how that'll meet. And in the foreground here, it kind of trails out to just being sort of open air walking down. If we come to this edge, you look down, you would see that across the way, the same thing we see here. And that will be the movement of these stairs coming down. We across here. stair there and now whenever we come to the stair aspect of that you see a major one right here we'll do that uh, as an example of the rest the pitch is going to be the tread riser ratio of moving up from the oven of the dead up to this upper terrace up here and so that's a strong line that runs up it this is the pyramid itself and on the other side it keeps trailing off and extends on that vanishing point. So we're drawing now probably the longest distance we've had in the sketch in this 10 point series of literally uh, probably a mile and a half of movement just from this point to the distance in the back there. So to give any idea of the scale of those, if we associate that with human endeavor of moving up that, the types of treads are, are well beyond what we have to do sort of accurately in the sketch. So we'll just diagram in the notion of these moving across to show they are rising up from the base up to there. And then to give a definitive scale to the height of those, because no matter where you are in the world, the scale to all stairs is predicated on the human figure because that's an ergonomic reference. So if you manipulate that, you manipulate how people move. So to make them... Uh, utilitarian and, and purposeful, they all follow the same equation that um, two risers and one tread, if you add them together, they can't be more than 26 inches and less than 24. So somewhere in that realm are the stair tread riser ratio for this, and then it steps back over here towards our end and does it one more time. And these are all horizontal lines. And again, they're going to trail back. They're all parallel. They're going to trail back to that point. Don't worry too much about making them all vanish because it's such a tight line work that'll all fit that area fairly well. And then there's a break right about to here. And that steps out and we have yet another one that rises up. To the terrace. And a tall one takes people directly to the base stage of the pyramid proper. And then a bit back down the way, there's a shorter terrace in front of the pyramid. And then a, a very thin one. And then its twin in front of it comes down. And then the rest are just camphored walls, which are supporting the earth from pushing out from its wall up above. And then way in the distance, you see a couple more of the angle that periodic will take people off again from the avenue dead back up onto the ceremonial spaces. So at the base of this, terrace one, two, and three, there is a very short plinth for it, where it wraps around. And at the top, there's a little celebrated wall. It's the smallest horizontal piece that wraps around. And then you see a little bit, because up at the top is where the most ceremonial aspects of it and it's a little bit of a bump out from our final piece there. So with the lines laid out here, uh, what we're gonna do is lay down our first kind of zone of picking the, the sun's position. So let's establish it on the right here. So we wanna make this appear broader and brighter 
and the facing of the step down to the Avenue of the Dead. So we'll simply come over onto the opposite side and wash those out right away. When this comes up here, it's sort of a step down piece that moves along in a block like fashion. So I'll find the left side of those also darkened up. And obviously, the vegetation that's closest to us, even though it goes back really far in the distance, will be a nice dark to kind of end our horizontal view across the plane. And we'll pick it up on this side too. Even though it's sunlit, it'll still see a, a certain darkness to it. And now we'll we'll work on this in terms of it's subtly, but for now, we want to have that depth of that mountain plane in the back. It's so far back, we don't see it actually moving down to the ground. It just looks like a straight, flat, two-dimensional tone because it's still very, very far away from walk and proper and the one over here it's even lighter so the same mountain range there comes back and we see less so we'll differentiate that we move uh, further on but that's kind of our placeholder of value that's going to light this space up so on the sides of the the projection now if the sun's coming down here it will create shade lines on these part of the stairs, which also step just like there, yeah, there's a plateau and a step over here. So we see the shade side of those as they step down. This one steps down to the positive, so we'll see the top of that plinth. So that's twin on both sides of it. Now over here, this is stepping down so that the stair has got a movement to it going up. And then there are little bracket walls that project out. Into the Avenue of the Dead. So we'll see the shade side of those. One or two others along the way. And right about here is yet one more stair that I had missed earlier. Go down. And there's a little bit of movement of the vegetation that comes from the background that actually comes up onto the plane of the top here. So that's between here and the distance, but then there is vegetation, the same type of tree that's actually closer to us and rises up just about to the underside of the second plane here. So we'll use those as a reference to create shade then. And then wrap around the corner over here and in the front. So those, goes, those are going to be the same uh, tree over here as the backdrop, but they'll be deeper in value because they're closer to us. And then a couple on this side of it, which will also be darker because they're closer to us. Again, the same vegetation has to receive a greater value if it's in the middle ground than in the background. Now the same is true for the foreground here. We've got the shade side of these ruinous walls. It'll help kind of articulate the projection of these stones. And 
And then the cast shadow line, because this comes down and throws a shadow onto here and then the ground, which again is gonna be a little bit darker than the shade side of the wall. So that will come down and throw a shadow line, the base of this one as well. Then we'll detail this later because it's in the foreground and then we'll also kind of treat this edge as part of the, the plinth there. We probably want to separate this plane from this more uh, larger stone basin here. So this edge is a different consideration of walkway than the one that's adjacent to the stairs of the temple proper. So we'll put a value in for the foreground. Just to pronounce that edge instead of just a line word. And we'll simply wash it out toward the white of the bottom of the page and not make too much information there. And then make that value strongest right where it comes to the edge itself. And this has a whole series of large flat surface stones. This part of the avenue. So we want to have some type of description that will kind of float from being white over here to more articulate as it meets the edge of more of the, the, the uh, more graveled path. On the top of that wall there. And then as it, it moves out, it kind of stops. Maybe this is more of through the years, they've changed the surfaces just to modernize it for tourists, but that break of all that texture ends right about here. So we can collapse that line work as flat shards of stone parallel to the ground plane that is a cruder walkway than the gravel adjacent to it. And that's one of the brightest aspects in terms of being a white in the sketch is the sun lighting up that space there compared to the coloration of the stone that we see in the rest of the area. And all these guys have not really handrails, but they've got sections of stone that come down and, and bracket both sides of it. So again, the estimated population are from 100 to 200,000 people, making it the sixth largest city at the time in that epoch. Um, settled in 400 BC at the earliest possible date, probably its zenith was 400 AD, and then probably gone by the 700s. Mayans and the Aztecs discovered these and then sort of absorbed some of the culture, the deities, the rituals, the practices in Aztec notions of uh, faith-based ideas. And Tiwakan is actually an Aztec word that re referred to this place they discovered as the city of gods. It's the seventh largest pyramid after the ones in Egypt, El Mirador in Guatemala, and the Great Pyramid of Cholula in height. Okay, so our next aspect is to bring in um, that edge work conditioning of the line work, which will give us our final value of line. And then we'll go from 40% to black again to pull the architecture off the page. So again, we're coming from this cornered view shed here. 
I'm looking at right about here. And again, this doesn't sit directly on the ground. It sits on its own plinth. So still beyond, beneath this is the step down to the Avenue of the Dead. Okay, so obviously one of the most key things is to pull it off the backdrop of the sky beyond it. So we'll come to the top and then make sure we really move that delicately across that plane because that detail of how it steps is the most important kind of profile of the architecture. And it's gonna step through that last one and finally come down to that plane. And then we wanna have the steps that go up the side too. So behind those trees there, the tops of each rise will be actually defining space beyond them. So make sure you're always changing your pencils. The ones I just did, some of the stonework has become a flat point to it. We've lost any type of detail. So bring in your next sharpened one and make sure you delineate that and hold that edge. You turn around the corner, even on the bright side now, that edge is very important, those back corners, to pull that off of its neighboring line weight. And then we'll use that line work over here to edge the raised platform. And then parts of the architecture where it projects out and holds volume next to it. So every time the stair projects, this side of it is holding space beyond it, this side isn't. The rest of these lines are stuff for things facing us, so it isn't really hiding space. But here again, that will that well, this one, marching on down there. Some will be sexualized with drops of space coming off of them. And now moving toward this edge, this uh, backdrop of the mountain frame, is a flat plane there, but we wanna make sure we wanna accentuate and grade at our values so that that flat plane becomes a darker value as it meets the brightly lit stone of the temple itself. So coming off this edge, where it used to be a black line, it's gonna be value which eliminates that line and simply becomes the tone next to it. And then that fades back into being the original tone we put down. And the trees in the distance that are much closer to us then the mountain range have a stronger line to them and maybe see a little bit of their trunks coming down to touch vegetation beneath. And then a very sort of short span, we're trying to create our foreground, the middle ground of our structure, and sort of a double background, the trees that are going beyond it and then the really far background of the mountain range there adjacent to it. So the same is true on this side, even that distant range was just lighter than this one, when it comes up in corners against the structure, it'll go darker, which means the tree here has to go darker as well, because this is the closest vegetation to us. There's nothing in the view shed of the photograph that we can use on the foreground side here. And now very quickly, I think because of compositionally, it's uh, a bright blue Mexican sky. So if we simply do something that moves opposite the brightness here, we can move something probably from the basin. And the side of the pencil just come over and have that sheet drive toward our subject. And we'll blend it up and take it to the other side because we need that little bit of tone to accentuate the brightness of the sun on the stone.
And then again, to uh, as an artistic license, we can move across the page and not treat the sky as one tone the whole way as it probably is visually interpreted, but having it being a little bit more domineering toward the left here, and then maybe getting a little bit stronger in value right when it comes to the edge of the pyramid. So that will have the depth of the sky be right adjacent to the edge of our shade sign. And then quickly diminish off to the wide of the page on this side. So it's cloudless, but it still has some activity to it where it changes value across of its plane. If you make it monolithic in one tone, it'll read more vertically. If you pronounce some aspect, whether it's the top or the bottom being brighter or darker, it'll move the sky in a dimension that's more horizontal. You just keep building it up right toward the edge here. P. Watkins on one side of uh, Mexico. Chicken Itza is almost the exact same distance flipped on the other side. Distance between is about 900 miles, but they're really exotically the same in that they're both sort of astronomically aligned. We've seen that in other structures too, in terms of faith based architecture. The positions of the temples, sacrificial altars, even residential complexes are aligned to the movement of the sun at different times of the year. So the heavens up above to most of the more primitive cultures would have been tied to their understanding of their beliefs in the sky above as an act of part of religion. So we'll come in the foreground now so we could pull this closer to us. And now because we see sort of the uh, finished block being taken away, this is probably scavenged and used as a resource for builders in the area in the, the latter, uh, at, towards the end, 750, moving to the Middle Ages, that we see just sort of the constructive stone here. So we'll see a little bit more of the actual shape and size of, of the bouldering before they came to their finish block. And we'll just use that in the corner to break down this wall so it doesn't seem monolithic and it really shows the kind of the, the wear and tear of time and mankind on architecture. And we're not doing anything sort of totally realistic. It's just, again, at this point, it's diagrammatic. And then its edge, which shows the crenellation of different stones in space, is stronger on this side as it turns the corner over here and on this side. And so it makes it a bit of a subject, but it's not, it's sort of in de degradation, so it's not too much of a subject matter for us. And then on this one, it's less because it's further away and it's going to have more value on the shade side anyway. So we'll lose some of the information and it casts its little shadow at the base. And maybe we see a little bit on this side as it moves back to the cast shadow from its adjacent wall. And because this is further away from us and it also has a shade side facing us, we'll just see just a start of it at the corner and it'll dissipate out. So we're controlling how much information because if we rendered this too much, it would become subject matter on the site. And again, this is the edge that creates space behind it. So this end of the stone wall has more of a strong profile. Same is true here at the top to break this line spatially to move off of this plane down into the valley across and then up the stairs to the other side. So maybe one last thing to give the sense of scale, because even with the stairs like this, you're trying to judge the sight of a human. If we actually drew in some of the tourists today, they'd probably be at a scale at this point with the head and a torso on their legs. 
and we'll group them. We'll do a couple down the road. Getting more diminutive, change the value of the torso for the legs beneath them. Cast the shadows so they're actually on the site there. Do some further down in the, there's a plaza in front of this, the cross axis for the Pyramid of the Sun here. So a lot of people take their photographs there. Put them in the distance. If you change the scale, the people become children. If you make them larger, more adults. And again, you move back toward the perspective, they'll get more diminutive anyway. It would be just little bits of graphite and distance walk with the, the, on the avenue. A little bit of finishing detail here. Each one of these blocks has got a finished course of finer stone. As it carries on, there's still a lot of the city that progressed out toward this axis over here, but the information is so small, just to break that up into diagrammatic lines to show more information, but no detail to it might help. And now right down the spine here, if this is an axial thing in the center of a big piazza, plaza, open space that then moves along this direction perpendicular to the Avenue of the Dead, then it celebrates a stair that mounts up right here as they make their way to the top of the temple. So we can simply bisect this and that's the midpoint of it, bisect this, that's the midpoint, bisect this, and that's the midpoint. So now at an angle that's going to go up somewhere between this one and that one coming down, so it, it meets that point, that'll show you the midpoint of that stair that's going to step its way up. So that's the center of the stair, so we can make parallel lines on either side of it. which will chase up the pyramid. And though, even though they're very perceptible at all, we can come back in and give them a little bit of a line tone, which will give a value of the stairs that are cut into the pyramid proper so people could make their ascent. So then to really change the scale, not only are they moving back and getting smaller, but they're moving up. So people on this plinth up here would be probably at this scale, so we could draw a series here to give a sense of the ascent. And they're so far away, they just be little tick marks of value. Making sure you get a little bit of a torso, small little dot for the head, and then some stri striking for the legs below. And that's enough to show that that's still sort of an animated part of the tourist path when you make it here. Our final steps now is kind of clean up that last little bit. We've got our line work in. Now, where do we go with the absolute 80 to 90 to final black in the drawing? We're going to push the value along our initial skins here. When it hits the white, we're going to add to the right side, creating more and more pressure with the pencil until finally we reach maybe a 60 or 70 here at the corner. Do the same over here on the one above it and here there. So it still is just in shade. It's not receiving, uh, on the shade side, it's not receiving shadow cast onto it, but we wanna have that project out to us. And the best way to do that is to shroud the white with the dark on either side of it. Uh, we could do a little bit of that here as these project out onto flat planes closer to us. And a little bit on these. This just shows some more of the 
the closest objects to us get the most variety of value and uh, change over. So the cast shadow next to the shade size. It's doing undercarriage of the trees in the distance. If you bring more value to them, they'll come closer than the mountains behind them. You're walking from the first part of the first millennium coming into its own by one CE and coming to its apex in 500 CE and then sort of just disappearing in time until being rediscovered by the Aztecs. 